if you listen carefully, you will probably think that that is correct. If you don't listen carefully, you think it's a bold lie. Because what I'm going to talk about tonight is the prior to Seacoast. Uh, Seacoast Babies was uh, Citizens Bank of Stewart and First National Bank of Stewart. And uh, those two banks became Seacoast Bank. Uh, and my son is uh, now running the Seacoast Bank. Uh, so that is good. Uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm going to first uh, kind of set the stage. Uh, Seacoast came here in 1933 in February. And Seacoast, uh, what did Seacoast have to face? Uh, Dales and my father uh, was Seacoast. He, he ran the bank. Uh, he and one other person. Uh, what did he have to face? So I'm going to set the stage for you. What would a banker see in 1933 coming to Stewart? Uh, and they, uh, uh, got to get this. No, oh, there we go. I'm losing. Let me know if I lose the sound. I can't, I can't say the sound and see my, and see my lecture. But uh, uh, to, to begin with is population. The population of Florida was pretty small in the 20s and 30s. I think in about 1920, our population uh, was about a million dollars for the whole, a million people for the whole state. Uh, back in 1898, which is only 120 years ago, there was no Miami, it was Fort A, and there were only several hundred people living there. So Florida has come a long ways quickly. Uh, probably, Martin County had maybe 4,000 people in it. I can't get this thing right. Are you all hearing it still? Yeah. All right. Sound out if you don't. Uh, and then we come to the 1920s, when things started moving in Florida. And I believe what really caused things to start moving was the railroad. Uh, uh, you know, Mr. Trotter got the railroad all the way down to Key West. Uh, it came to Stewart in the late 1890s, probably about 1898. It was probably in West Palm by uh, of, of 1900, and it was probably down with the Keys before 1920, well before then. And uh, people could get to Florida in the, with the railroad, which was a lot easier than trying to drive down US 1, which was not finished. It was a lot of it was uh, shell rock. And, uh, actually, I read some years ago, that US-1 was not totally paid between Jacksonville and Miami until in the mid-1930s. So if you had to drive your car, not too many people came. There was no place to stay. They'd have to camp out. And so that kind of held people back. But the railroad opened it up. And of course, they started building hotels along the railroad. So people did have a place to stay. and. Uh, Values started going up. Uh, people wrote back home and said, Florida is great. Uh, this Christmas day, I walked out of my back door in my bathing suit. It was nice and warm, and I picked four oranges and took them in and had a nice glass of fresh orange juice. You better come to Florida. And people began to want to come to Florida. They, for a while, everybody wanted to come to Florida, buy a little bit of land, and come down here and live in this wonderful place to live. And uh, or come down and buy land and let it make you rich because it was starting to grow in value as people discovered Florida started moving here and they wanted to, they wanted part of Florida. So uh, things were building up and up and up and uh, the realtors and the uh, they were only too glad to help out and the people would come by, by train and the realtors would meet them with a bus and uh, take them out to the, to the subdivision that is being sold that day, and they arranged everything. Uh, you could buy a lot for $10 down and $10 a month, and how can you lose? And if you held a lot a year, you could probably sell it for a profit and pay off your debt and have some money for your pocket. Now, people like that, and if you bought acres, it was much better, and people were, were making a lot of money, and uh, it got to be, uh, where prices were going up 
uh, pretty quickly. And people liked that, and that brought more people in. Uh, more houses were being built, subdivisions developed, and uh, things were really moving along. And prices kept going up, and people said, well, how high can this go? You know, what is the top limit of real estate? And uh, I think wise people then started uh, selling out or slowing up, but it still kept going. And then uh, a funny thing happened in Miami. A large sailing schooner that carried cargo wrecked itself right in the channel uh, in, in Miami, and no more ships could come in. Uh, it was, uh, uh, they, they could not bring any building materials in from the ocean. And it took them a couple of months to get that ship moved out of the channel. Uh, but still, we had a railroad, right? No. Uh, Flagler had shut down the commercial shipping, uh, freight shipping on the railroad because uh, his roadbed was giving way. It probably wasn't built quite right when they built it in a big hurry. And his bonus stock needed work, so he stopped for two months to get the regular back in order. And so for a period of months, no building materials came into Miami, and construction stopped. People started looking around, and they saw the big skyscrapers in Miami. Not big, but they were tall buildings in Miami, which were half built, unfinished. There were subdivisions everywhere around the county, uh, around Miami, and and uh, that was the same in all of the big cities in Florida. And people began to thinking, you know, they, uh, people were not working and they had time to stop and think. And they said, you know, I don't think there's going to be enough people to come to occupy these big tall buildings and to buy the lots on these subdivisions. And people who owed money on their, their uh, uh, real estate started saying, you know, maybe we better sell now take our profit to pay off that debt. And they slowly did, and, and of course, so the first people in came out okay. But as it went on, uh, people began to realize what was happening, and buyers slowed up, and prices, instead of going up, started going down. Well, when the buyers saw that, they quit buying anything, and they sat there and sat on their hands, and property didn't sell, and before you could turn around, uh, prices dropped to zero. And anyone who owned real estate and had debt on it was out of business, they were broke, and uh, the banks failed by the dozen. And uh, that was 1925 when the Florida, the first Florida real estate uh, boom burst. And it cleaned Florida's pot. Um, so any banker coming in to, uh, Martin County in 1933 had that, but there was more. Uh, the, uh, uh, in 1928, we had a terrible hurricane, uh, which devastated West Palm. I don't know if it hit Miami, but it went out into the, uh, uh, the lake, and the wind out of the east blew all the water out of the lake, not all of it, but blew the water from the east side of the lake to the west side. And then when the backside of the storm got there, it blew it back the other way, and the, uh, the, they say a, a rush of water came to uh, uh, the cities along the, the eastern shore of the lake, and it just washed right up, and they had 10 feet of water in the cities that drowned people by the hundreds. And uh, that was kind of a downer for uh, prosperity in Florida. And then in 1929, well, you know what happened. We had the stock market crash, and anything left in Florida, and there wasn't much, but anything left was wiped out. Um, uh, so that's what Dale's dad and my dad had to face in 1933. Uh, there were no banks in Stewart at that time. Uh, the, there was a period of a little over here when Stewart had no bank. That was kind of inconvenient. You had to uh, barter with your friends. Uh, you could go to West Palm to Atlantic National and talk to Henry Smith or down to, up to Fort Pierce and to St. Louis County Bank 
and talked to Ed Goulet. That was an inconvenient. But we had a citizen named Ed Miniger, and he is a he was a very important person in our town for probably 30 or 40 years. Uh, his his brothers developed the Miniger Clinic in Kansas, which was a premium psychiatric clinic, I think, in the world at that time. And Ed unfortunately blew his hand off when he was in medical school, and uh, he, he did an experiment which exploded, blew half of his hand off, blinded him in the left eye, and that finished his medical career. He wound up in West Palm and uh, uh, decided to start a newspaper in the little town of Stewart. And, uh, he, uh, and, and while he was in Stewart, he uh, uh, became a very, very accepted person. He spoke after dinner. He, re he remembered every name. He could probably name everybody in this room if he'd been here for a while. Uh, just a, a brilliant person and very positive and happy all the time. Well, he told me one day how you could bank without having a bank. And he said he sat down in his office at the Stuart News. He was the editor and owner of the Stuart News. And he pulled out the checkbook of one of the failed banks. And uh, he owed the, the Stuart News owed, uh, a merchant down the street where he had, news had bought some equipment. $150, and he says, I wrote out a check to that merchant for $150. Uh, hopped in my Model A, go over to the merchant, and said, hi, Charlie, uh, I want you to do two things. I want you to endorse this check, settling my debt to you, or the Stuart News debt to you, and I want you to tell me who you might owe at least $150 to. Well, they, everybody knew it, they liked it, and figured out what he was doing, and he said, sure. He endorsed the check and said, I owe 100, more than $150 to the farmer out there who butchered six of my hogs the other day. And so Ed drove out to the farm and told the farmer what he was doing. And he said, sure, he endorsed the check. And he said, and Mr. Menninger, I owe the grocery well over $150. So Ed drove back to the grocery and told the grocer, the grocer endorsed the check. And then went on two or three more stops. And the last stop, was a merchant that owned the Stuart News. And Ed sat down and endorsed, endorsed it as owner of the Stuart News, went back to his desk, sat down, tore the check up. So that's how you can bank without a bank. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 you all know if you, you've read Alice's uh, last brochure on, on uh, uh, this, this museum that uh, where, where we went. We went into the, the building on Osceola and St. Lucie Avenue. It used to be where the alcoholics met. That was the only alcoholics uh, uh, meeting place in Florida that was surrounded by bars. So, <laughs> and, uh, we were the fourth bank in there. The first bank was Bank of Stewart, and it was there from 1912 to 1921 at which time it failed. Um, it actually uh, they changed the name to Stewart Bank and Trust, and they moved to another building at one time, but they still failed. Um, they were brought in both locations by the Asher Gang. Uh, next was the Seminole Bank, which was in that building from 1921 to 1929, when the Seminole Bank failed. Uh, then the Stewart Central Farmers Bank uh, went, went into that spot. They were there from 1929 to 1932. And uh, they saw the handwriting on the wall, so you couldn't make any money in the banking business in those days. And so they closed up, uh, sold their assets, paid their debts, and uh, liquidated. Uh, they did not fail. Uh, there was no loss in the bank, uh, but uh, the bank closed itself. Then we came to Citizens Bank of Stewart. Uh, uh, we were in there from 1933 to 1939. And we moved to, from that location down to Haney Circle uh, into what is now Duffy's Restaurant. And um, uh, that was moving out of town, actually. 
We were a monopoly. There was no other financial institution between West Palm Beach and Fort Pierce except us. We were it. We had it all. And all of it added up to almost nothing. <laughs> Being a monopoly uh, brings to my mind a, a joke on one of my relatives by marriage, uh, a guy named Chappie Swallow. Uh, he, he married my wife's sister, Margaret, who years later had a dress shop in Stewart. Some of you may remember Margaret's dress shop. Uh, well, Chappie and Margaret moved from Pennsylvania, where Chappie had been an officer in one of the big steel companies, and uh, moved in with the Pittmans, uh, his mother-in-law. And A.O. Pittman was the uh, owner and operator of the Gulf Station on Fraser Creek. And uh, he sold gas to the uh, boat, both boats and automobiles. Um, so the first day Chappie's here, uh, he walks into the citizen's bank, sits at my dad's desk, and introduces himself and says he would like to borrow a few thousand dollars until he can get settled in Stewart. And my dad said, well, uh, sorry, Mr. Schwab, but we don't loan, loan money to newcomers. Uh, we want them to live here a year with a good job, so we think we can count on them, uh, and then we could maybe consider a loan. Unless, of course, you have some collateral or someone who could endorse your home that we would accept. Well, Chapter was incensed. He wasn't used to being treated that way. And uh, he leaped to his feet, called my dad an SOB right there to his face, and went back to the Pittman's place where they were staying and told Mr. Pittman what he had done. Well, Mr. Pittman was a quiet, thoughtful person. He let Chappie wind down. And he said, Chappie, there's one thing you should know. When there's only one banker in the county, you don't call him a son of a bitch back to his face. <laughs> that got around town and it got a laugh for about two weeks. So Mr. Pittman took, took Chappie by the arm, put him in the car, and drove him back to the bank, and they made arrangements soon. And when Chappie became a very good customer of our bank and a good friend of ours, he worked for the Stewart News Company and for Southeastern Printing, which was a very very fine printing company uh, owned by the Stuart News, which printed secret documents for the government. And everything had to be letter perfect, and, the, and it was very secure. Uh, you didn't fool around that building, because you didn't know who would be watching you or what might happen. Uh, uh, so there we were, bank open. There was very little money left in Stewart. What little money had been lost in the two banks had failed. And any money left over, any serious money, was kept in the post office, at postal savings. And that was something that was devised in the Depression uh, for people who wanted to bank in a safe, secure place uh, rather than a bank. And uh, you could take your money to the post office, and uh, Mr. Hartman would give you a receipt, a little passbook and you could uh, uh, and, and it would show the amount you had deposited and you could take that money out any part or all of it any day you wanted you got a little interest because you could not draw checks on it and uh, that's where my dad said it took him five years before he thought he could all brought all the money out of the postal savings back into the banking business uh, the uh, The income of the bank was very small. There was, there was not many loans. Uh, the people actually, there was not a whole lot of loan demand, uh, unless you were totally desperate and then you couldn't get a loan. Uh, <laughs> the, the income of the bank came mostly from service charges, 10 cents a check. If you had 10, if you'd written 10 checks this month, when you got your statement, there was a dollar service charge, 10 cents a check. And uh, at one time we were making 50 checks, as we call them. And had a little printing press that would print your name on a check and, uh, and fold it up and make it a little checkbook. And uh, you, you would give that to the customer and charge his account $2 and a half. Um, 
the, um, the bank was a center of stewardship. Uh, the bank was downstairs, just two people, my dad and a lady named Ruth Stevenson, that was the whole bank. Upstairs was the city hall. If you walk into the bathroom in the back end of our uh, bookkeeping department, you would find there's two doors in the bathroom. Uh, the other door went out the other way and it went into the city police department. <laughs> so if you walked into the police department uh, and then stepped out onto the sidewalk, you would be on Osceola, you would be on Osceola Avenue, which was uh, 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 right next to the fire station. And the fire station was a big community center in those days. It had two purposes. One was to put out fires, and the other was to display anything unusual for you to come look at. And that was usually game. A uh, big eight-point buck, uh, a large turkey, uh, armadillo, which was very rare in those days. Rattlesnakes, rattlesnakes always got a crowd. People loved to look at rattlesnakes. And, and uh, there is a funny story about the fire station. I'm going to take time and tell you about it because it's funny. Um, the, uh, 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 we had a state highway patrolman that was stationed here in those days. His name was Clyde Hurdle. He was a fine, upstanding young man. He uh, was very honest and straight. Everybody liked him. And he loved to hunt fish with the boys, but he had never killed a turkey. And that was kind of a rite of passage for the young man. And he wanted a turkey pretty bad. And so one, one uh, evening near Christmas time, the boys called him up in the late afternoon and said, like we've got about 40 turkeys roosted down in South Fork. And if you want to go with us, we think you'll get a chance to kill the turkey. And he said, boy, I would get heat. The flight jumped at the chance. And sure enough, about 11 o'clock the next morning, they were all back in the fire department with this big turkey hanging on the hook. And John and, and Clyde standing there so proud, and the old boy standing around talking with him, and another crowd gathered, and they loved, loved it. One guy said, well, Clyde, tell us the hunting story. We want to know how it happened. He said, it was wonderful. He said, they, the boys picked me up about 4.30 that morning, and we drove way out 76, and down the wagon wheel road, which was one of the main roads to go hunting down to South Fork, and uh, went down to South Fork, and, and they put me out and put me under this big, big pine tree. And they told me they were going down to the swamp, and they didn't want me trying to walk into the swamp because I hadn't done that before. <clears throat> and they said, you stay here. When we shoot at the turkeys, uh, they will be flying out, and uh, a turkey that is afraid uh, we'll, we'll try to land in the big tree so we can, until he can figure out what's going on. And then he might want to fly down to the ground. And if you're under a big tree, you just might get a turkey to come right at you. And if you're careful, you can get him. So Clyde said the boys left me, and I sat there about five minutes. And all of a sudden, I heard a clock, which was the noise a turkey makes. And then I heard a gobble. And it was right over my head. I said, my goodness, is there a turkey in this street? And I said, I slowly looked up and looked up. And sure enough, there was a rising light from the, from the sun coming up. There was this big turkey sitting there. And his neck was stretched out. And I know he was looking at me, trying to figure out what I was. So I knew I had to be very careful. And, and I brought my, my gun up very, very slowly without making any fast move that scared the turkey. And I took squirrel aim right at that big old neck sticking out and squeezed off the shot, and he fell dead right at my feet. Oh my Here he is, isn't he beautiful? And he pulled the wings out so they could all look at it and fire. And one of the guys said, Clyde, what's that tangled up in the, in the turkey's feathers there? What is that? I said, I don't know, I haven't noticed that. He says, why, it's a card. And he got it very good, he says, Merry Christmas from the boys. <laughs> they had bought a, a big farmyard turkey that was so heavy that it didn't want to fly. And they got a ladder, got him up there at nighttime. The turkey stayed there. 
<laughs> so that was fun. Uh, the Osceola Avenue was the business street for Martin County, at least for Stewart, and really for Martin County. We were the biggest city in the county, and uh, uh, that's where you had retail and, uh, and the bank barbershops and such, and the movie theater. And so Osceola was a very important street. And there we had, we had the whole heart of the city, and we had the business area right there in our hands. And we were the only bank in town. So where do you think people bank? <laughs> we got most of them. And I, I'm gonna tell you about a few of the people there. there there's too many for me to tell you too much. Uh, the Lyric Theater was very interesting. Uh, it was built by uh, the Hancocks, Judge Hancock and his wife. And uh, I, I, admire, uh, I admire anyone who was probably built in the 20s when everything was so going upwards. But that was a big building to build in this tiny town with such a small population. And it has been a wonderful thing for our town. Uh, our mothers would give us a quarter, we'd go and spend a day at the theater. The ticket was a dime. You get a coat right across the street on the other side of the post of the theater arcade, and then you could punch the punch cards for another nickel. And the punch card was, was a, a, a board that had about 50 holes uh, drilled into it, and they had tiny little pieces of paper stuffed down in there, and then it was sealed over. It was made in the factory, and you could punch it out, punch out the card, and unfold it. And if it had the right number, you got a free Coca-Cola. So it was a wonderful thing to see. To see uh, the, I'm told that, that uh, uh, Mrs. Hancock uh, played the piano back before they had talkies. I don't know if that's true or not, uh, but when, in those days, by then, by 1933, we had talkies and the movies were movies just like they are now. Uh, the fun thing was to watch uh, Fred Astaire uh, dancing with Ginger Rogers and at the, near the end of the scene where the love interest had the balloon he would be saying something sweet and nice to Ginger and your the theater were getting deadly quiet as he listened what is he saying to her what is he going to say and here came an 8 o'clock freight train <laughs> Shake the bell and shake the seat. That was the only complaint I can think of for the lyric. Uh, next to the, to the lyric was the Green Dry Goods. Uh, that was the Green family. It was a big family here. Uh, and uh, Mr. and Ms. Green had about three retail stores throughout the state of Florida. And uh, they uh, were very good people. They knew how to run the store and they made money right along. And their children, Robert, who was my good friend, and his two sisters, Marlene and um, um, Mary Minnie Louise. Uh, everybody worked in the store. Everybody worked for day. You know, just this American way. And uh, that was a wonderful thing. You know, Mr. Green, however, died in the mid-30s at a very early age. And uh, his wife, Mrs. Green, picked up the reins and ran the store beautifully. Uh, Robert, Later on, went to college at Florida State, uh, where he was taking a course in retailing and all. And the teacher, they finally realized Robert knew as much about uh, running a store as anybody. And Robert became the assistant for the teacher. Uh, across from Green's Dry Goods was a vacant lot with a big two-story building on it. And uh, that was Long Bottom's barbershop upstairs was Dr. Harry Hickson's uh, dental office. And uh, Harry uh, was the only dentist in Martin County. And he used to say, they will always pay me. He says, when I pull that first tooth, if they don't pay me for it, uh, when the next tooth starts hurting and they come to me, I remind them they still owe me $12. <laughs> and the people would somehow find the $12 quicker. But, uh, uh, on the, each side of that building was a stairwell, a stairs going up on the outside. 
open stairs over to the air, and my mother was dragging me up there. I was about seven years old, and I had to have a filling. I wasn't looking forward to it. And we, I, I started up the stairs with my mother dragging me up, and I see someone's coming down. And I looked, and it was my good friend Ben Arbogast, who was my age, and Ben was falling. He was crying. And his mother, Eva, looked very angry. And uh, apparently, and Ben never cried. That was one thing. He, he would hope he would suck it in. But he was crying. He was letting it go. His, his lips were all swollen. His, his shirt was red with blood. <laughs> he was coming down. He saw me. And he quit crying just long enough to say, don't go, Gordon. Don't go. <laughs> He took him on and went, went, went right by me, by me and, and mother drove me up. We went into the, the first room was the, was the sitting room, and then there was the room where they did the dental work, had the big chair, and mother walked right in where the big chair was and said, now Harry, I want to stay here while you work on court. And, and my mother's name is Beatrice. He says, babe, and he put his hands on her shoulder, turned her around, put his hand on her back and gently pushed her out into the waiting room and shut the door. Turned around and looked at me and says, get up in a chair and shut up. <laughs> it, it, had, it had enough with Ben and now I had me. So he was grinding down and you know those were slow grills. They would get hot and they would burn your flesh and you would smell burning flesh and it hurt. And the Novocaine didn't quite kill everything. And I kept sliding down, and I wound up sitting on the footstool. And Dr. Gibson was still grinding down, and finally got it done. And, uh, and uh, that was over. I was so glad. Uh, let's see, who else can I tell you about it? <laughs> we, we come on down, and uh, between Osceola Avenue and Flagler, which is up by the railroad, uh, when you went past Green's Dragons, it was mostly vacant land there. Uh, it was not being used. There was no stores on it. There was one store, a freestanding building, that had uh, uh, Jolly Bozum's barbershop in it. And that's where I got my haircuts. And uh, Jolly, he saved his money. He didn't waste his money. And I'll tell you about him in a minute. But uh, then you come on down to Haney Circle. There was no village on any circle. It was totally vacant. Uh, there was one down there. That was Dr. Parker's office, which was a two-story wooden frame house. And you had to walk through a little field of periwinkle flowers. And every time I smell, uh, uh, smell periwinkle flowers, I think of Dr. Parker's. He was one of the nicest people in the world. His big problem is he did not like to bid. He didn't want to ask for money. He kind of felt that was impolite. And his his wife, Margaret, just had a fit over that. She, she was left with a job of trying to collect the money and pay the bills. And uh, uh, she worked with him. And uh, he, he was a dentist, uh, I mean, a, a doc, he was the only doctor in Martin County. And uh, he, he went out, he would drive out to your house and look at you. He, you didn't have to go to, the, go to his office if you didn't feel like it could. Uh, we come on down to Haney Circle, or uh, we're at Haney Circle. There's only that one uh, building there. And then you go on down east on Osceola till you come to the uh, Pelican Hotel. Uh, that was a fine hotel. It was owned by the King family. They were uh, professional hotel people. And Bill King ran the business. And uh, it was high class. Uh, the hotel was only open in the winter. It was this clientele were mostly Jewish people which is very unusual. We had a very few Jewish people living in Martin County, and uh, they all liked to fish, and the charter strippers would pick them up and uh, 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 take them fishing, bring them back to the dock. They had a big dock there. And, uh, and the, 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 people, the anglers would come in and give their fish to uh, uh, Russell Holloway, who was an Afro-American cook, he was an excellent cook. He was really a chef, and uh, he cooked for Patton during the war. 
and he would cook their fish for them, and they wouldn't have fish for dinner that night. Uh, the hotel was a real nice hotel. Uh, most of the people there, Heinz, Bernardo, uh, were also in show business. Uh, one of them, I think his last name was Kraft, uh, Mr. Kraft, and he was a designer. He designed many big theaters in New York, Chicago, and I think in, in Europe. Uh, he was quite a noted guy. Uh, we had uh, the sports writer from the Atlantic Constitution, um, and um, I can't say his name, uh, Channing Cove. Uh, he, he was one of my favorites. He was a nice guy. There was no liquor allowed. Uh, that was a rule from one of the king ladies. And the clients, if they wanted to have a drink, had to have a drink in the room before dinner. Dinner was at 8 o'clock. Uh, one seating. Um, the, my wife, who was engaged to me, the poor girl, and uh, <laughs> we were engaged for a year or so, she was desperate at the hotel. And uh, one of her jobs was to hand out the mail uh, to the people, but, uh, and, and she did so. And uh, this one old gentleman uh, used to uh, get his mail during the dinner hour when everybody's sitting there. And he was quite deaf and almost blind. And so he would have Ann open his mail and read it in a loud voice so he could hear it. And of course, everybody in the, in the, in the hotel, in the dining room, heard it, and, and uh, that was an amusing thing. They enjoyed that. And, uh, there was never anything serious in the letters, but uh, Anne read them. And uh, there was a guy named, named uh, 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 Graham, uh, Mr. Graham. I can't remember his first name. He had a big car agency in Atlanta. It was quite wealthy, and he was a lot of fun. And he, he thought it would be a great joke to write a nasty letter to this fellow, <laughs> using the most profane language he could think of. And, and so it arrived. Of course, everybody in, in the dining room was in on the joke and waited for Anne to open that letter. And Anne read about two sentences before she realized it was a setup. <laughs> I got a big laugh. The last thing about the, the uh, Pelican is that one of the old gentlemen, that they, each room had his bath, had, own, had a private bathroom. They didn't have to walk down the hall. That was modern. But what was not modern is there were no showers. There were big tubs with four, four lion feet uh, holding the tub up. If you remember seeing pictures of them, if you hadn't seen them. And uh, you would fill the tub and sit down and wash and clean yourself. And, and of course, one of the old gentlemen turned the water, turned the hot water on, walked back to do something, and forgot. Oh. And he finally went, went up downstairs, and water was running through three different floors and did a lot of damage. So that's that's the hotel business. Now I'm going to change the date on you. You've gone through 1935. And now I want you to go to about 1945 or a little later than that. The Depression's over, but there's a war on now. And now that caused other problems. Uh, and, uh, but we lived through those problems. I'm not, I'm not going to get into the war. That would take too long. And I'm taking too long here, too. I'll try to wrap this up. Um, <coughs> the, there were two nice buildings built after the war on Haney Circle. They were both built by Arthur Dahome, who was, uh, his father was Teddy Dahome, who was a fine realtor. And uh, Arthur's wife, Betty Kay, had a father who was an architect. I think he must have designed, designed those buildings. They look nice. The one on the, the northeast corner is a single story, is still there. It's curving linear around the street. And in it, there was uh, about eight uh, places to rent. And um, uh, one of them was called the Oddity Shop. That was owned by Julia DeHome, who was Arthur's sister. And, and, uh, and, uh, and Eva Arbogast's sister. Eva was the only one of Ted uh, DeHome's 
daughter is to marry. Uh, June was a maiden lady, but she was fun. She was a nice lady. And when my dad took me in there to buy flowers for mother, uh, it, uh, she was always so nice. I loved her. It was a high quality gift shop, and uh, the, all the girls registered there when they were going to get married. So their silverware and their plateware uh, could be registered, and everybody would know how to give them a gift for the wedding. And they all prayed they would get at least four cents. They don't do that anymore. Uh, Caddy Corner across from that is another rounded building. It's two stories. <clears> that was Arthur's building too. And uh, the top floor, top floor was for offices and the bottom floor retail. And you notice where Dr. Parker's office had been, and they had moved it. They moved it over to uh, uh, Ocean Boulevard, which was 4th Street. And where his office had been is now a kind of an open air restaurant. Uh, called El Patio, and it was owned by Bruce Jokes, and uh, had about six bar stools with a, uh, a counter that you could eat your breakfast or lunch on. I don't think they served dinner. And if you happen to be lucky this morning, uh, a little after daylight, you'll see about a five-year-old little girl uh, perched up on one of the bar stools, and uh, Bruce Jokes was feeding her scrambled eggs, toast, bacon and orange juice. And uh, uh, you, you notice she's still in her jammies. And you wonder, what is that all about? And you look down the Osceola back towards the Pelican Hotel, and here comes Bill King walking real fast with a worried look on his face <laughs> until he sees his daughter, his fifth daughter, Quintina. And uh, then he relaxes, comes on up and has his own cup of coffee. And, uh, Bill told me that he could not keep Quintina in. She was determined to get up every morning and go to El Patio for breakfast. And they tried all the ways they could think of to lock the doors, and she could figure them out. If she couldn't, she went out the window. So uh, that went on for a few weeks. Uh, and then you look on the north, and there is the North Port. There is a brand new building, the Citizens Bank, cast into the front. There's pictures. There's some things to look at over here after it's over. We're going to look at it over that table. But uh, the, um, uh, uh, where was I? <laughs> well, that went out of my mind and I heard. <laughs> the Citizen Bank. Uh, it's Art Miller, the whole one, I believe. Designed by Phil Clark from West Palm Beach. It's had probably six maybe eight people working for it by then. And the interesting thing, uh, we had a big bookkeeping department uh, off the lobby, and there was a blank wall that went all the way across the back end of that uh, bookkeeping department. Clean wall, no doors, no windows. And my dad hired Joy Postal, who was a noted artist in those days, and she uh, painted beautiful paintings of birds and wildlife, and she uh, loved to paint murals. And Dad had her paint a mural on that, and it was the most beautiful mural you could see. Uh, a customer come in and stand in our total window and look at the back end of the equipment department, and there was this big, big long mural of the Everglades. And you, you could look at it, look like you're looking into infinity. And that was really something. Uh, it's hard to leave. Uh, hanging circle without talking about Lady Abundance. I'm told that when Lady Abundance was given to the city of Stewart, uh, the, the city, of course, didn't look a gift horse in the mouth and they accepted it. But it was embarrassing to some of the leaders of the city. And she was hidden down in the back end of some of our, one of our parks. I put a lot of planning around so the children wouldn't see it. And so I'm glad to see the Lady of Mondays has now appeared and is in full sunlight, and I think that was a beautiful bronze piece of art. Uh, I'm going to have to, there's one other funny story uh, about <coughs> C.B. Arbogast, uh, the father of my good friend Ben. And he was a good realtor, he had a fine reputation, one of the highest regarded people in town. 
and Ernie Lyons, who was probably by then was editor of the Stewart News. Um, Ernie used to do a lot of after dinner talks, and everybody loved him. And he, one of his talks was on how Charlie Arbogast had tried to suck him in to a real estate deal. And of course, everybody's ears picked up because Charlie was not that kind of a guy, and everybody knew it. He says, What is Ernie got in his mind? What's up his sleeve? Just listen to this. And uh, Ernie said that Charlie called him one afternoon on a Friday and said, Ernie, come over here if you will. I'd like to talk to you about something. Ernie said, I jumped in my car. I thought maybe I'd get a story for the paper. And he drove over there. And uh, Mr. Arbogast said, Ernie, he says, you'll never get anywhere or have any money until you have real estate. You can't make any money on a salary. You've got to make money on real estate. And I've got a deal here I think you ought to get into. It'll make you some, I think it'll make you quite a bit of money in a few short years. And uh, Ernie said, well, uh, what is it, Mr. Arbogast? He explained it. And he said, well, well how much is it? And, uh, Ernie, and Mr. Arbogast said, Charlie said, well, I mean, Ernie said, well, I, I can't pay that. I, there's no way. And uh, Mr. Arbogast said, well, well, we'll arrange financing. And uh, Ernie said, he said, Danny Hudson isn't going to give me any loan for that amount on any real estate, you know. And uh, uh, Mr. Arbogast laughed. And he said, we've got it all arranged. And it was not for the bank, I'll say that. He said, I've got it all arranged. And, uh, and if you can't make the down payment, I'll make the down payment for you. And you can pay me back when you sell the property down the road. And, uh, uh, and just sign here, and you'll be glad. And Ernie said, well, I stopped. And then I went home, went to bed that night, worried about it. He said, all day Saturday, I worried about it. Sunday, I worried about it. Finally, on Monday morning, I, I hot-footed it back over to Mr. Arbogast's office. And said, I, he said, Mr. Arbogast, I, you caught me at a weak moment. I really don't like that. I want out of the deal. And he said, uh, Mr. Arbogast opened his drawer and pulled out the deal that Ernie had signed and tore it up in pieces. He said, okay, Ernie, you're out of the deal. And Ernie said, I felt better. But he says, the end of the story is had Mr. Arbogast uh, followed the law, he was not allowed me to get out of the deal. But he didn't. He followed his, his instinct of what is right, what is wrong, and what is ethical. And because of the high ethics of Mr. Arbogast, that's why I'm not a millionaire today, because the property he had he set high was part of the heart of what is now Fort St. Lucie. And Mr. Arbogast knew that they were, being, get, they were getting ready to start a development going. And so that was a funny story. Um, the, uh, we came up our federal charter in 1950, uh, our state charter in 1958, and became a national bank, which was uh, uh, people from the north were not sure of how each state chartered their banks and whether they might be weak or not. But if it had the word national in it, uh, it had to have certain qualifications. And that's why Dad wanted to have a national bank. So the policies in 1958 were 12 million, loans were about four. Uh, Dad was a tough lender. He had a lot of jokes about him. Uh, one of them is that my dad I had a friend who was very sick and needed a blood transfusion. And he, he, and so my dad gave him a blood transfusion, but the guy died. And so he said, well, what caused the guy to die? He says he froze to death. And, and, and think about it. And, and, uh, and of course, there was the old joke, this is more when we were first national. And they said, what's the difference between a terrorist and first national? And uh, the answer was, you can reason with the terrorists. <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to have to stop here. I've been talking almost for an hour. Okay. Another 15 minutes if you want to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is that, is that
nine television stations in that lobby. No longer four little television stations. We had nine. We couldn't think we'd ever need more than that. That is great. And we had four dry bands. And this is not funny. They were on the back side of the bank. They had to be connected to the bank or they would be called a branch, which was illegal. So we had four of them across the back side of the bank. And, and they were sideways. They didn't cross 90 degree angles. They were right up against the bank, and the, the drivers had to drive around with other cars. They drove around four cars and were still in the room, they had to go around and start over. So it was not satisfactory. And David just came in one day and he looked so upset. And I said, Well, what's happened, David? He says, Those two guys out there almost got in a fight. And they banged their fingers together. And, and uh, I tried to calm them down and they almost jumped on me. And so I. I said, well, gosh, what are we going to do? Well, we had a, another miracle. Uh, the Daibo company um, uh, invented a vacuum tube, a steel vacuum tube, that could be wrapped in, in a waterproofing material. You could bury it directly in the soil, and uh, you could run that from the bank to a dry bank for 100 yards or so. And um, so then, so then we could put drivers up where they are now, to the east side of our bank, and they're still connected to the bank, so they were not, not branches. And we did that, and we made sure we did enough. And uh, we had eight drivers out there, and it started out for four more. And then, guess what happened? The state legislature made ranching legal. <laughs> You'll find a beautiful, large, quiet, subdued lobby with nine television spaces, <laughs> with maybe two tubs there, and, and uh, that's why you see those eight drive-ins out there, four of them are used to park cars out of the sun, and the other four, they're using about two of them. Uh, that's why that happened, and uh, it was, uh, our mistake was not assuming that the state would finally uh, uh, allow ranching. And that's a whole other story. Uh, I don't have time to tell you about that. Uh, uh, that brings us up to about 1960, 1970. Uh, I'm going to finish up now. Uh, one of the biggest ones we had after those days was flower farms. Uh, Martin County was a flower farm capital of the world for probably 10 years. Uh, a fellow came in from Pennsylvania and said he was a flower farmer and he opened an account and said he's going to grow uh, chrysanthemums. And I said, oh, sorry to hear that. Uh, you can't grow chrysanthemums in Florida. They grow up north. And he said, you watch. And they, they did. They, the flower farmers became very wealthy. Uh, they knew what they were doing. Uh, they, they, the beds were beautifully rototilled. They brought in German peat by the ton. In fact, Germany finally made it illegal to export peat. They were running out of it. And uh, they, they could put a seed there and it would grow beautifully. The soil was sterilized totally, no bugs. Uh, they would pull black cloth across the fields to make the flowers think it was summertime and they would grow tall and big long stems, big long strong stems. And then when they, they would take the black cloth off and put lights on the fields, and uh, at night the whole county would be lit up by these hundreds and hundreds of lights. Yeah. And that would make the plant think it's springtime and it would bloom. And they actually could put a seed in the ground that they know would be a, a red chrysanthemum for Mother's Day. They could, they could do it like that. That was great, and that was a big thing. It put a lot of people to work, labor intensive. Uh, every housewife in Martin County almost was used to roll those flowers into newspapers, and then they were packed in boxes so they could get to market without being damaged. Uh, we went into credit cards, and 
I hated that. I hated credit cards then, and I do now. I think it brings people into trouble. Uh, they started in Chicago, and I saw we were going to have to do it, so I called uh, Mr. McKinney down at Father National in West Palm Beach. The Father National had had credit cards for a number of years. And I said, Mr. McKinney, he says, it looks like we're going to have to go into credit cards, and I don't know a damn thing about it. Well, what can you tell me? He says, son, as long as you don't ask him to pay it off, you'll be all right. <laughs> and so, so we sat down. We spent two months with whole staff going through our loan records and our deposit records and telephone books and anything else we could think of to try to find people we thought would be worthy of to give a credit card with a limit of $300. <laughs> we didn't want to jump into it. You know. and we did it right, except for two problems. One problem, we had a, one of the bad lists got remixed into the good list. We didn't know that until later. And the next thing we did is we bought the, loan, the portfolio of one of the local restaurants. And uh, that was a mistake because almost none of those uh, people paid. Uh, but we had the restaurant account, we still had it. And uh, so we, over the years, we didn't lose anything. Uh, but uh, credit cards now are having problems. It's, it's, it's uh, not credit problems, it is uh, a fraud problem. It is horrible. Uh, the gangsters in the underworld have learned how to use fraud. They don't come into a bank with a gun anymore. They do it with computers. Uh, so I don't know where that's going. Uh, we had the automatic teller machines, but there was no teller. And uh, we, we had a, a Saturday and Sunday to train our, the, the population of how to use them. And we advertised it. We had people there come, and we had people there outside showing them how to push the buttons and put in the car and pull it out and everything. And then they would get a, instead of getting cash, they'd get a little slip, which uh, it was to say that they had won maybe a dish or a TV or a, a little radio, something like that. And boy, they, they were busy all Saturday and Sunday. We taught people how to do it. The final thing is fun with bank examiners. Uh, <laughs> bank examiners, I have a high respect for. Uh, the, the, I think it's the only government people that you can really trust and depend on. I really believe that the OCC, the Office of the Control of the Currency, and the Federal Reserve, I believe their examiners are serious. I believe they're trying to do a good job. I believe they want to make the banking community stronger, and uh, uh, I really have high regard to it, despite what I say behind your back. Yes. Uh, in the old days, it was, they were a lot nicer to us than the other day. Today, they're not nice at all. They don't dare be nice. But in the old days, we used to take them to dinner and drinks after the exam. And I always wondered, I said, this doesn't seem right, but we do it. And uh, the examiners like it, we'd sit around and talk about banking problems and everything. And it was, we traded information. We taught each other things. It was, it was nice. And uh, uh, <laughs> one thing about our bank, in those days, we mailed out the bank statements with your checks in it. Remember when you got your checks back? And uh, mailed them out at the end of the month. The last day of the month, everything went out. And Carabao Law, in those days, was our cashier. Carabell insisted that when you finished your work on, on the last day of the month, whether you're an officer or an employee of the bank, you would report yourself to, to the bookkeeping department and roll up your sleeves and help stuff statements uh, to the mail to make, to get it done. And the bank examiners had happened to that as the day they finished their review of the exam, and they were ready to go to supper. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but we've got to go up here and help stuff the statements. It's going to take us a good hour. And they said, well, we'll go with you. We'll help you stuff it. And the bank examiners were helping us run the bank. I thought that was wonderful. Uh, my dad always said, if you keep a strong bank, 
uh, you can reason with examiners. And I would sit at his desk and cringe while he reasoned with the examiners. And they would criticize him with a law. I said, Mr. Hudson, you, you, uh, you told us you would, that he would reduce this loan last year, and here it is another year, and he hadn't reduced it. And when is he going to pay it? And Dad would say, well, probably when he dies. <laughs> and they would shrug, shrug their shoulders and let it go at that. And uh, we had no trouble with the examiners, because we did have a strong bank. Um, the, uh, um, then we got to 1983, uh, we've been in business 50 years, and we formed a bank holding company, which was called Seacoast Banking Company. And uh, our deposits in 1983 was $205 million, and the loans were $130 million. I'm sorry to take so long, but I just get, I skipped a lot of stuff in here. I could have talked about it. I tried to get the things that were funnier. Thank you very much.